In this video, we will cover the paired t-test, when to use it, how to calculate it, what each part of the formula means, and we will run through a worked example to show it in action step by step. Now you'll remember in the last two videos, we've looked at both the one sample t-test to compare our team's mean vertical leap to that of the entire NBA, and we applied an independent samples t-test to compare that same metric against that of our rival team. In both cases, we found our team's mean jumping height to be significantly lower, and thus as coach, we instantly ordered the team to take part in an intensive and targeted four week training program to improve things. This program has just ended and now we must assess the results. But what is important is that we are no longer comparing against either the population or another team. We are instead comparing one sample, in other words, our team before and after the training program. And this is exactly what the paired t-test is used for. So our question this time is as follows. Has the mean vertical leap for our team increased after the targeted four week training program. Based on this question, which contains a specific direction of interest, we will be applying a one tailed test. And as we always must do before we go and run any numbers, let's go and specify our null hypothesis, our alternate hypothesis, and our acceptance criteria. Here, our null hypothesis is that the mean vertical leap for our team after the training program will be equal to what it was before. Our alternate hypothesis is what we're testing for or what we're interested in. So that will be that the mean vertical leap for our team after the program is indeed higher than it was before. For our acceptance criteria, let's again just put in the commonly used value of 0.05. And just as a refresher, this acceptance criteria value will essentially act as a line in the sand around which we make our, for the lack of a better word, conclusion around which hypothesis we think is more likely. So what do we need to do to figure all of this out? Well, as we've learned over the last couple of videos, there are really three main steps. We must first find the critical value for our test based upon our acceptance criteria, of 0.05. Now, you'll notice that since our question was directional, in other words, we want to know if the mean jumping height is higher after the training program, we are just interested in one of the tails of the distribution. And because we are specifically asking if it is higher, we are interested in the tail on the right hand side. And thus, this is where our critical value will exist. Once we have that critical value, the next thing we will need to do is calculate the T statistic for our test. And once we've done that, then we'll look to see where it falls on the distribution relative to that critical value. Because with these two bits of information, we can state our conclusion where we will either reject the null hypothesis or where we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. And when we get our result and we state our conclusion, we will discuss exactly why we make this decision and what it means. So let's do this. Let's start with step one and find our critical value. And as we've done before, we can get this from our one tailed t-test lookup table. And we need to find the value that exists at the crossroads of our degrees of freedom value, which in a paired t-test is nice and easy. It's just the sample size minus one, or here the number of players in our squad minus one, so 29, and our acceptance criteria value, which we set to 0.05. And as you can see at this juncture, Function, we get the critical value of 1.699. So well done, that is the first part of our three step process. Let's head back to our distribution and put that value in. Now, just as a bit of a refresher, this critical value, it is the point that splits the area under the distribution curve by our acceptance criteria of 0.05, giving 5% of the area on one side and 95% of the area on the other. Now, unlike the past couple of videos, since here we are interested in the right hand side of the distribution, we take this as positive 1.699. And remember, we can do this because a T distribution by definition is symmetrical. So there we go. That is step one of three complete. Step two is to calculate the T statistic for our test. Now, before we look at the formula for this calculation, let's take a look at our data. Now, for a paired T test, we need to know the individual results for each of our players before and after the training program. And you can see this on screen in our table. The first column is the player ID, and then to the right of that, we have columns showing each player's best vertical leap measurement before the training program, their best leap after the program, and the difference between the two. So for example, for player one in that first row there, their best jump before the training program was 84.1 centimeters. Their best jump after the training program was 85.3 centimeters. And this equates to a difference 
of 1.2 centimeters. Now, I've only been able to fit a selection of the 30 players on screen here, but we would have this data for every player in our team. At the bottom in green, we have the mean and standard deviation for the before scores, the after scores, and the differences. And if we take a closer look, it does appear like there's been some improvement, at least in terms of the overall mean. So 67 centimeters before and 68.15 centimeters after. But looking at changes in the mean alone is not what we are here for. We want to be more rigorous, so let's keep moving. For our paired t-test, this data that we have on screen here is going to need to go into this formula here. But what does each part of this mean? Well, as we always do, let's put it into words. At the top there, we have D bar, and this represents the mean of the differences. In other words, the average of all of the before and after jumping height differences across all players in our squad. Down below that, we have SD, and this is the standard deviation of the differences. We also have N, the sample size, or in our terms, the number of players in our squad. And as you can see, the formula tells us to take the square root of this. And with all of this combined, we will get our T statistic. So let's run the numbers and calculate this together now. And to do this, let's just simplify the formula like so. And then let's feed in the numbers that we require. So at the top there, for the mean of the differences, well, we have that in our table of data at the bottom there, a value of 1.11. Below that, we also need the standard deviation of the differences, and we again have that at the bottom of our data. This is equal to 0.95. And finally, we just need the square root of our sample size n, which is 30, and the square root of 30 is 5.48. Let's go ahead and calculate the bottom part of the equation there. So 0.95 over 5.48 is equal to 0.1734. And with that, we have everything that we need. So if we calculate 1.11 over 0.1734, we will get our T statistic. And I can tell you that this gives a value of 6.40. And if we head back to our distribution, we can see that this T statistic value of 6.40 would fall here at a point outside our critical value of 1.699 and lands us firmly within this 5% area. And to put this into words, what falling into this area means is essentially that if the null hypothesis was true, in other words, if there was truly no difference between our team's mean vertical leap before and after the training program, we would expect to see a T statistic as extreme as this based on the differences in the means less than 5% of the time. And because of this, we see this as some form of evidence to suggest that the null hypothesis is unlikely to be true. So formally, based on all of this, we will reject the null hypothesis. And we would say something along the lines of with an acceptance criteria or significance level of 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternate hypothesis, which essentially translates to we have some confidence in the notion that our team's mean vertical leap has indeed increased following the targeted training program. So as coach of the team, this is the first bit of good news that we've had in a while and seeing all of these statistical tests in action has really given us a taste for more. I mean, we could test our team's vertical leap stats after the training program against both the overall NBA and the rival team and see how that's changed. Perhaps we could split our squad of 30 into two groups and run two different training programs and then test which program gets the best improvements. There are so many things we can assess with hypothesis tests. You just need to know the basics of which test to choose for a particular scenario and the steps to follow. Now, as I've mentioned a couple of times throughout these videos, you would seldom calculate these tests by hand. You'd use Python or R or SPSS or Excel, but knowing how the basics all work gives you a nice platform to understand why they work the way they do, and it allows you to check your results if you want to be absolutely certain that it is all working as it should. In the next video, we're going to look at a slightly different type of test that will answer our final question as coach, which is, is the three-point shooting percentage of our newly signed player higher than that of our current star player. For this, we'll be moving away from the t-test and instead utilizing what is known as a chi-square test for independence that will work well for the type of data we have, which is proportional data, specifically the three-point shooting percentages of two players on the team. The chi-square test, while sounding pretty fancy, is actually really intuitive, so I can't wait to run through it with you. I will see you in the next video.